Let me introduce today's speaker, Dr. Puna Wong Yin On. Dr. Puna Wong graduated from the University of Malaya. He joined Monash University, Malaysia in 2007 as an associate professor in internal medicine to form the pioneer faculty of the clinical school in Johor Bahru. He has been sharing the Dharma regularly in Malaysia, Singapore, and Jakarta in the past two decades, and was an invited speaker at the third, seventh, and eighth global conference on Buddhism. Dr. Puna authored his first Dharma book entitled Walking in the Buddha's Footprints in 2016, which consists of a compilation of 100 reflective essays by him. In October this year, he launched his second Dharma book entitled Breaking Myths and is now sharing chapters of this book with us. A huge fan of the Star Wars movie series, Dr. Puna derived much inspiration from the stories of the Jedis, which he felt are based on Buddhist themes. You must learn, you must unlearn what you have learned. This is a famous quote by the Grand Jedi Master Yoda. And this is exactly the purpose of Dr. Puna's Breaking Myth Dharma series, to help us unlearn some misconceptions we have on the Buddha's teaching so that we practice the Dharma with right understandings. Now, it gives me great pleasure to invite Dr. Puna Wong to commence his sharing today, entitled, Emptiness is Not Nothing. Over to you, sir. May the force be with you. Good evening, <coughs> and Namo Buddhaya, brothers and sisters in the Dhamma. Today, we are reaching the 10th sharing of our series. And while you might see it labeled as number 11 on the notes, the reason was because I wanted to share this ahead of number 10. And that's why this is the 10th sharing of this series. Now, after nine sharings, I felt we should go a little bit deeper and try and understand some more profound concepts in the Buddha Dharma. And hence tonight, I will try to go a bit slow so that we can understand what is meant by emptiness or sunna in Pali and how does this help us in our cultivation and in our progress in the path. Now, the one core teaching that differentiates the Buddha Dharma from theistic religions is that while theistic religions are based on faith, the Buddha Dharma is based on wisdom. When people take refuge in theistic religions, they are actually taking refuge in power, the power which they believe in through faith of an external being saving them, bailing them. While in the Buddha Dharma, our refuge is true wisdom, knowing, understanding, and knowing what we have to do. Now, the one core teaching that differentiates the Buddha Dharma from a theistic religion is that within the Buddha Dharma, we must all strive to have direct understanding of the Dharma, and especially of emptiness and non-self. It is not uncommon that you will read in literature of teachers who say that you should not teach non-self or emptiness until the student is ready. After nine sharings, I think we should go beyond what we have been sharing and take a step 
into this topic. Now it's cerebral understanding, it's easy, but direct insight is needed. The Buddha said, now take a gentleman who memorizes the teachings. And once they have memorized them, they examine their meaning with wisdom and come to a reflective acceptance of them. So we must reflect on the teachings and see for ourselves whether it is true or it is not true. They do not memorize the teachings for the sake of finding fault and winning debates. It is not for intellectual discussion, but as tools to help us. And they realize the goal for which they memorize them. And because they are correctly grasped, these teachings being correctly grasped, those teachings lead to their welfare and happiness. So this is important because when we understand the Buddha's teachings, it leads to your lasting welfare and happiness. And I often say that if you study the Buddha's teachings, if you walk this path and you become more unhappy, something is seriously wrong. This is taken from Majjhima Nikaya 22. Now, of course, we must have sila, we must have dana. That's the very foundation. But once we start this practice of reflection, this practice of reflection begins with us looking deeply within. Guan zi zai. Guan in Chinese is to observe, to contemplate. Zi as in zi yourself, not like watching TV, but watching yourself. Zai as in xian zai this moment, now. So right mindfulness in every moment is needed for you to understand, for you to pursue what is true and perfect wisdom. And in walking this path, the understanding of the Dhamma is not theoretical, but from direct observation and then validating what we have learned in theory. So one of the very important things that we must clearly see and realize by our own insight is that the five khandas are empty. Now, one of our greatest delusions and attachments is to a concrete self, a permanent self. But what we need to see by our direct insight is that what we call a self is not an inherent concrete or absolute entity. We must see the emptiness of the self. And when you can see the emptiness of the self, it helps you to shatter your strongest delusion and your most beloved attachment. Remember, the attachment to the self is one of the four upadanas, one of the four strong attachments which gives fuel to our re-becoming. So when you can see the emptiness of the self, you can shatter this delusion of a concrete, inherent, absolute entity and help you break this attachment to this that you call the self. And in that process, it can help us transform our suffering. So, Now, if you are an alien with the ability to go beyond ultraviolet on the higher spectrum and below infrared on the lower spectrum, and you look at any one of us, you will probably see an image like that. All right, those people who use infrared vision binoculars, for example, will see a person like this. And those of you who have walked in, for, in front of thermal screening using infrared and you look at it on the TV screen, you will again see something like that. What we call as the self is an image created by our senses. 
the five aggregates, the rupanama of processes ceaselessly in motion that we misconstrued as a solid independent entity, I. Here, I want to break a little myth. Sometimes we don't really understand what rupanama mean. I prefer rupanama than nama rupa, and the reasons will be obvious. First, there is a form, a physical form, a structure, and that is called the rupa. Now, we are familiar with the nama aspect, sensation, perception, mental formation, and consciousness. So form, sensation, perception, mental formation, and consciousness are the five khandas, something all of us are familiar with. And our understanding of Malay plays a very important role here because its meaning is the same. Rupa means a form. We call the Buddha Rupam, the image of the Buddha. That's the form, the physical form. Sensation, perception, mental formation and consciousness are the four components of how the mind perceives. We must have consciousness to be able to perceive. And the rest of the other three will come along once you perceive. And these four components of how we perceive will lead us to give it a nama. That's why it's rupa nama. By giving the perceived rupa, which is the form, a nama, literally a name, we create an identity, separateness, and plurality, a duality now of I versus them. And if you are a biology student or a medical student or a medical doctor, you understand that this is the function of the left lobe of the brain, whereby we perceive and construe identities and give it names and see it as different and separate from each other. Now, in Buddhism, the ego is seen as a delusion of an independent self. Again, those of you who are familiar would know that in the culture of the Buddhist time 2,600 years ago, people believe in an Atman, as many people still do today. People think that there is a permanent I, something beyond this structure of you and me, something permanent, eternal, indestructible, which goes from life to life to life, independently. Some people today call it a soul. In the Buddha's time, they call it an Atman. But when the Buddha looked and looked, he saw that there is no permanent substance within this that we call I. He could only see ceaseless change and transformation. Hence, he named it Anatman. When you add the word A-N in front, it becomes the opposite. In Pali, it is known as Anatta. So what the Buddha saw and taught us is Anatta, non-self, no permanent, independent entity, which is eternal and indestructible. Instead, a good analogy is we are like gushing streams of energy that you see in a stream of water, a river flow flowing that is ceaselessly changing, complexes of activities that is constantly in motion, transforming from one state to another state. And this is what a physicist or a biochemist will also tell you. So those before us extend back into the midst of time and those after us, we will become those after us from one arises another. Not an eternal thing moving from one body to another, but we becoming bawa from now to another to another. Let me illustrate. 
A modern word which I find useful is that we are technically recycled from life to life. From one arises another. Not the same, yet related. Not the same because the next one is another identity, but that next one came because it arose from us. So it's not the same, yet it is related. The old identity is gone, but a new identity arises from the old. So this is a very useful cartoon a child asks, when you take apart, the adult asks the child, when you take apart a Lego house and mix the pieces into the bin, where does the house go? The child in its innocence says, it's in the bin. The adult says, no, those are just pieces. They could become now remade into spaceships or trains. That house previously existed was an arrangement of the Lego blocks. The arrangement doesn't stay with the pieces and it doesn't go anywhere else. It's gone. In its place, when those blocks become recycled, they make a new thing, maybe a spaceship, a car, a train. So we are similarly recycled from life to life. From one arises another, not the same, yet related, the old identity is gone, but a new identity arises from the old. This is a concept which is not easy for many to understand. This is a Lego man sitting on a boat. And my wife and I visited this particular Buddhist museum in Thailand, I was very impressed because this tried to illustrate people sitting on a boat crossing from one shore to the next. But sitting on that boat is a Lego man. Once you dismantle that Lego man, he is no more. This is a Kong Lego man on a boat. Now the word emptiness in Chinese, Kong describes the callousness of all things. There is the external appearance. In Chinese, in Cantonese, we say Kong Xiang or Kong Xiang, Kong Sam, something which is empty in its core. There is an external appearance, but the core is empty. The five Kandas are empty means that what we had previously seen or perceive or think is a solid entity that we label self, that we label sister Liming, that we label brother juicing has no innate unchanging substance, no permanence, no inherent or independent eternal existence. It is constantly changing, constantly evolving. And everything is produced from causes and is connected to and conditioned by everything else in a complex web of cause and effect. Nothing exists independently in an unchanging state. Now, in the very first noble truth, the first noble truth is summarized with the line Pancha Upadana Kanda Dukkha. The five Pancha Upadana clinging or attached Kandas, the aggregates, is Dukkha, dissatisfaction, stressful, unsatisfactory suffering. So as long as the five Kandas are grasping or grasped upon, it's going to create Dukkha. So suffering this ease, disappointment, dissatisfaction is present whenever you have clinging because you simply cannot cling or rely on what is impermanent, unstable, unreliable, changing and non-self. 
And our five khandhas, our self that we perceive as permanent, is actually impermanent, unstable, unreliable, changing, and non-self. Material and sensual happiness because of this very nature is very fleeting. So the five grasping aggregates or the five aggregates of clinging in the first noble truth summarizes dukkha. And the Buddha in Samyutta Nikaya compared form, our physical structure, to a lump of foam, feeling to a bubble, perception to mirage, mental formations to a plantain trunk, which is like a banana tree, which has no hardwood, and consciousness to an illusion. And the Buddha asks, what essence monks could there be in a lump of foam, in a bubble, in a mirage, in a banana trunk, in an illusion? Impermanence, that changeability that all of us are subject to is the misery in the world. Now the second noble truth teaches us that the cause of our dukkha or suffering is craving. Brothers and sisters, please note, craving is an emotion. It is our emotional desire to want things, to want objects, to want sensual pleasures. And very importantly, we want things to be eternal. We want things to be permanent. That is why it is so easy to sell you a concept that it is eternal, that it is permanent, and people will fall for it like ants for sugar. Now, I put three dots there because this is very, very important because the reality is the opposite. This tale of eternal life in heaven is so blatantly, and people buy it up. And it is a serious error which the Buddha has condemned unequivocally. In Majjhima Nikaya 22, the Buddha said, but self and what belongs to a self are not acknowledged as a genuine fact. This being so is not the following a totally foolish teaching. And this one, this, this which is sold to you is the self and the cosmos are one and the same. After death, I will be permanent, everlasting, eternal, imperishable, and will last forever and ever. And but the Buddha said, this is not a fact. The fact is the opposite. So is this not a totally foolish teaching? And the monks replied, what else could it be, sir? It is a totally foolish teaching. This is very unequivocal. Now, on the other hand, for us who are walking the path, to see the causes of suffering, we must see the emptiness of the five khandhas, the five aggregates. And in doing so, obtain direct understanding of the three characteristics of a nature, dukkha, anatta, impermanence, suffering or dissatisfaction, and non-self. Because in doing so, you will realize the futility of craving, clinging, and greed. And when you can realize this, you transform your suffering and distress. So remember, the line goes, when you can see that the five khandhas that you think is yourself, which is in your delusion, something permanent, that you can see that these five khandhas is empty, then you will do ichie kua. You will be able to transform your suffering. Now emptiness is not nothingness because all forms are empty of a permanent unchanging self there is now the potential to transform to something else. That Lego block which formed the house 
can now be transformed into anything. So emptiness is the potentiality to evolve given the right causes and conditions and the form precisely because it is empty of a permanent self can be transformed into something else. So we must realize that we are an activity in ceaseless change, not an entity that is concrete and unchanging. Form, feeling, perception, mental formations and consciousness, our five aggregates, provide illusions of independence, self-sufficiency, or a seamless unitary whole. But that's only an illusion. In the Heart Sutta, it is said, form is not different from emptiness. Emptiness is not different from form. Form is emptiness. Emptiness is form. And the same is true of your feeling, perception, mental formation, and consciousness, i.e. your five aggregates is not different from emptiness. Emptiness is not different from your five aggregates. Form is the first of the five khandhas or aggregates, the rupa, as I illustrated earlier. But it is not just within. It also includes all external objects as perceived by our senses. Now all form is empty, like a drum with no solid core. Remember the Chinese word, kong, which means it is empty, like an empty pail. Kong sum, something that has nothing inside. So form has an external appearance but it does not have an unchanging solid core. In contrast, everything is constantly changing. What we see is not what it is. It is not solid, independent, and unchanging. But within this knowledge of reality, the form that you perceive exists as a temporary composite object. Hence, form is exactly emptiness. Emptiness is exactly form. Emptiness does not mean nothingness. Again, let me illustrate. A watch is empty of an inherent self, for within the aggregates of springs and gears, nothing is inherently a watch. But the combination of all these components makes what we call a watch with a function of an instrument that tells time. So like our body and mind composite, it is a complex of aggregates that is empty of any permanent self. So we function in an ephemeral environment, very transient. All things are indeed real but they are not in the way we think it is. Form is no other than emptiness. Form exists. Emptiness is no other than form. Form is exactly emptiness. Emptiness is exactly form. So the concept of nihilism, that things do not exist in any sense and that nothing continues after death and the concept of eternalism that there is existence in objects that will exist unchangingly forever are both clearly rejected in the Buddha's teachings. Now all our graspings, attachments and aversions is generated and developed by the activities of the five khandhas. Whether you love the smell, the look of durians, it is true your five khandhas through your six sense organs. Whether you like anything for that matter, it has to be mediated through your body and your senses. So the six perceived objects of form, sound, smell, taste, touch, and object of thought by our six senses, in Buddhism it's not five, it's the six because the mind is the sixth sense, 
is distorted by our wishes, fears, and opinions. Even our objects of thoughts are just passing images and not I. It is not I think, therefore I am. You can think, but you need not be. And Sister Li Ming may say, hold on, my body clearly exists. What is this teaching seeing? Well, with the realization of emptiness, your eye, your ear, your nose, etc., do not exist in the way you conceive of it. What do I mean, Sister Li Ming? In the Heart Sutta, it says, no eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and mind. Why does it say no? It's because all these are just labels. We say an eye, so you see an eye there. Can an eye exist by itself? Can it function independently? Can any of the others that we listed there function independently, exist by itself? No, none of them can. None of them can function independently. The eye can only function as an eye when it is part of the whole. If you take that eye out, it is completely useless just a lump of functional, functionless tissue. In fact, a lot of people will faint. So it is just a name that we give to it. Eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, mind. If you take it out, it's just amino acids, proteins. It becomes a functionless lump. So therefore, with understanding emptiness, all the elements of your experience, the 18 datus, the six sense organs, the six sense objects, the six sense consciousness are empty. Therefore, if you seek refuge in them, it is only going to give you dissatisfaction, pain. And that is why we say, recognizing this, we refrain from latching onto things as I, me or mine. Brothers and sisters, this chart shows you how you and I perceive. You have the five khandhas, you have the rupa, and you have sensation, formation, perception, consciousness. And then you have our faculties, eye, ear, nose, tongue, body, mind. And then of course they see sights, sounds, smells, taste, touch, and physical and thoughts. And that give rise to the six consciousness, eye consciousness, ear consciousness, etc. So these are called the 18 datus. None of them can be independent. All of them can only function as part of a composite whole. And when they are part of a composite whole, we perceive things. So we perceive our body, we perceive Brother Bobby, we perceive a fan or a light, and then we give it an identity. We give the rupa a nama. We give that form a name. And then once we do that, we perceive it as something independent, separate, a unitary form that seems to be seamless, while in reality, it is not. If you look at Brother Bobby, take a photo 10 years ago, you may be able to recognize him, you may not. Take a photo 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, I am quite sure if we take a photo 50 years ago, you will not be able to recognize him. He has completely changed. Now, the Buddha said, this is for those who do not know. So if you look at person and he does not know the Dhamma, Take an uneducated, ordinary person who has not seen the Noble Ones and is neither skilled or trained in the teaching of the Noble Ones. They have not seen good persons and are neither skilled nor trained in the teachings of these good persons. They will regard form like this. This is mine. This, I am this. I'm happy, I'm sad, I'm whatever. This is myself. They will similarly regard feeling, perception, choices, whatever is seen, heard, thought, known, sought, and explored by the mind like this. 
This is mine. I am this. This is myself. So this is for those who do not know. But for you who know, who understand the Dhamma, you are an educated, noble disciple. You have seen the noble ones. You are skilled and trained in the teaching of the noble ones. You have seen good persons. You are skilled and trained in this teaching. And you will, understanding emptiness, understanding non-self, you will regard form like this. This is not mine. I am not this. This is not myself. And you will know these three lines refer to anatta. They also regard feeling, perception, choices, whatever is seen, heard, taught, known, sought, and explored by the mind like this. This is not mine. I am not this. This is not myself. From Ajima Nikaya 22. Brothers and sisters, when you see this truth of emptiness, the result is the transformation of the way we think. You awaken. Pain, suffering, distress will lessen even as our body ages and degenerates. Even when our interactions in society result in undesirable and unpleasant consequences. Because we know it is anicca, it is dukkha, it is anatta. What do you expect? We learn not to be taken in by the appearance of things. And freedom from suffering comes from not clinging to an ever-changing slippery objects and relying on it as your source of happiness. Those of you who had attended the previous talks who understand and remember the Zen story about the venerable asking for the fan made from rhinoceros horn. Tells of a very similar lesson here. So emptiness as a quality of phenomena means that you cannot identify any phenomena as one's own self or having anything as mine or I am. Because all phenomena, be it your table, your chair, your body, they are unstable and unreliable. So when your computer can a virus or when your computer's software breaks down, well, that is un happy, but it is expected because that is the unreliability and instability of all conditioned things. We want your computer to be stable and reliable, but the reality is one day when you least expect it, this will happen. Emptiness as a mental state means that you develop a mode of perception in which we neither add anything nor subtract anything from what we perceive, simply noting there is this. And this is from the Bahia Sutta. In what is seen, there is only the seen. In what is heard, there is only the heard. In what is cognized, there is only the cognized. And you will remember, if you remember the Bahia Sutta, when this person called Bahia understood this line that the Buddha taught, he became awakened. Emptiness is the mode of perception which lacks all the usual conceptual elaborations that we add on top of our experiences, such as the sense of I and mind, like and dislike. Now, please, brothers and sisters, it is not a metaphysical view. Understanding emptiness is not a theoretical or a philosophical discussion, but a strategic mode of acting and of seeing the world so that it leads to our happiness and liberation. Now, everything is ever evolving and ever changing. Emptiness is conceptually liable to be mistaken for sheer nothingness. I tried so hard to explain that it is not nothingness, but emptiness is in fact the reservoir of infinite possibilities that because we do not have a concrete unchanging core, 
you can become anything, even an Ahan, even a Buddha. In the Sunna Sutta, the Venerable Ananda asked the Buddha, it is said that the world is empty, the world is empty, Lord. In what respect is it said that the world is empty? The Buddha replied, in so far as it is empty of a self or anything pertaining to a self, thus it is said, Ananda, that the world is empty. So this sutta describes emptiness as the lack of self or anything pertaining to a self. Very importantly, Dhamma brothers and sisters, both in the internal and external sense media. That means that sense media that I described just now, how you perceive, whether it is internal or external, they are all empty of any concrete unchanging core. Any sense of self that surrounds objects is not inherent in them and is simply the result of our I making and my making. Now you will understand when you hear this line, Sabbe Dhamma Anatta. This is from the Dhammapada. All phenomena is non or not self. Dhamma, when written with a small d, means phenomena. Let me give you another example. Sister Suchen asked me to give lots of examples. So I have received the edict, and so I'm giving a lot of examples. Let us look at the candle flame, something we are all familiar with, as you offer on the altar, a candle. And the candle flame said, I am the fire. I am beautiful and bright. I am great and powerful. I can give light. I can burn. I can boil. I can create. I can destroy. Like the candle flame, we too often say, I am this or I am that. We laugh at the candle and we say, how ridiculous. It's just a composite of many factors. It's just energy. There is no I inside the flame. Any student of chemistry will know. There's nothing solid or eternal or unchanging inside that flame. It's just fuel undergoing combustion. Do you not realize that you are also exactly the same? Try not to eat for a day and you will have no fuel for combustion. We are just activities. We are just energy. No solid entity. Emptiness. Kong. That's the external appearance, but no core. We say, I am happy. I am suffering. In reality, there is suffering. There is happiness, but no I. And you are like that flame, that candle flame, without the eye. You are just energy, heat, compassion. That's the bottom line. If you don't believe me, as a physicist, as a biochemist. So the truth of becoming, like the truth of change, applies to everything. While the truth of change and Nietzsche states that nothing is permanent, but is ever-changing. The truth of becoming, Bawa, tells that everything is always in the process of changing into something else, however short or long the process may be. I was too once a young person, like my chairman here, but I had changed in those years into something else. Nothing is, but it's becoming. If you look at Paticca Samukhada, if you look at dependent origination, and you will see Bawa, B-H-A, B-A. We are always becoming. A ceaseless becoming is the feature of all things. So if Sister Liming understands this sharing tonight, she will have become slightly different from the sister leaving one hour ago. A small plant is always in the process of becoming an old tree. There is no point in time in which anything is not becoming 
something else. Now you will go back to physics. When we were all in form six or pre U, in my time, there's only form six, no choice. We learned this famous equation in physics. E is equals to MC squared, where energy and mass is interconvertible. In the Heart Sutra, it says, When you understand emptiness, when you understand non-self, nothing in reality is created or destroyed, is defiled or pure, is added or lost. Matter and energy merely transforms from one state to another in an ever-flowing flux. The selflessness and beginningless nature of all things. We are always changing from one form to another form. At birth, we become this. Then as we grow older, we become a teenager. As we grow older, we become an adult and finally an old man and we die and you will become something else depending on your karma. This is the emptiness of nature. All right. This is the characteristic of nature. All existence produced by causes and conditions will involve changes, unfixed, non-staying, unstable, unreliable, without ever remaining in the same state. This is what impermanence, a nature of Wu Chang means. And seeing this impermanence is the start to understanding suffering and non-self. And when your mind opens to this reality, it evaporates the attachments to things that cannot be attached to. I would very much like to visit you all in KL, my children overseas, but I can't because it's anatta. The external conditions have changed and I can't control that. I think I can control it, but I can't. And lately my wife and I has been visiting hospitals more than we have been visiting restaurants. Again, even our bodies we cannot control. Even our bodies is anatta. We think we own the body. In reality, we don't. You can't stop it from aging. You can't stop it from falling sick. So I like this cartoon of a lady who spent a lot of money on her breast implant, liposuction, gym, diet, dietitian, etc., etc., And the venerable tell her that you are not your body. Of course, she's shocked. We think that we are our body, but is yesterday's I the same as today's I? I have given an example earlier. Even Sister Li Ming an hour ago is going to be different from Sister Li Ming an hour from now. They are different. There is no unchanging continuous I that stays the same. This is what non-self means. But it does not mean that Sister Li Ming does not exist. Of course she exists. It's just that it is only temporary existence, not eternal and certainly not in our control, not in her control. So some Buddhists say that the Buddhist practice, some people say that the Buddhist practice is to dissolve the self, the ego. Now this is wrong because they do not understand that there is no self to be dissolved. There is only the notion of self that we need to transcend by wisdom, by understanding from the venerable Thich Nhat Hanh. Now, all of life depends on the fact of emptiness. Ultimately, we are all connected, interdependently changing from one state to another, neither created nor destroyed. From the beginning to now, all the energy in the universe is remained the same. It merely transforms from one state to another. We can evolve to the highest mental state of a Buddha, a fully enlightened being, because there is no permanent self. If there is a permanent self, you're gonna be stuck here or stuck there. But no, 
because there is no permanent self, you can evolve. Emptiness invites us to see the singularity of nature. Carl Sagan, the famous scientist says, down, down, down deeply at the molecular level, the tree and we, we are essentially identical. I'm sure any biology student will know that. Now, quoting the Buddha again, the Buddha said, certain ascetics and Brahmins misrepresent me with the false, hollow, lying, untruthful claim. The ascetic Gautama is an exterminator. He advocates the annihilation, eradication, and obliteration of an existing being. Like what Venerable Pignahan said, people have a misconception. I've been falsely misrepresented as being what I am not and saying what I do not want to say. In the past as today, what I describe is suffering and the cessation of suffering. This being so, if others abuse, attack, harass, and trouble the realized one, the realized one or the Buddha or the fully enlightened one, he doesn't get resentful, bitter, and emotionally exasperated. On the other hand, if others honor, respect, revere, and venerate him, he also doesn't get thrilled, elated, and emotionally excited. He just thinks they do such things for what has already been completely understood. Dhamma family, please remember this line in purple because I'm going to explain further. But with regards to the first part, this is exactly what the Venerable Thich Nhat Hanh said. People misunderstand the Buddha and thinks that the process of this path is to dissolve or to get rid of the self. That is not true. There is no self to get rid of. They do not understand. There is only the notion of self to be transcended. Now coming back to the purple part, wisdom, attainment, people praising you, people blaming you. Understanding the emptiness of self, of what need is there to egoistically maintain pride, position, attainment to a high or higher level of wisdom and knowledge. When you understand this, therefore, with understanding emptiness, there is no need to claim wisdom, attainment. Your conceit will fail. Now you can understand this lying in purple. Even when people condemn the Buddha or people praise the Buddha, there is no emotional reaction that you and I, in our very emotional states of mind, will respond almost immediately. So even when we are studying at an advanced level, Maintaining the attitude of a beginner is ideal. Eager, humble, ready to learn. Ready to discard the baggage of misconception and culture easily, just as a beginner would. When you are a beginner, you're like a sponge, ever ready to learn, unlearn, accept. But when you think you know, then people who teach you or share with you anything contrary to what you think you know, you're going to see it as an insult to your ego. You're going to see it as, ha, this fellow knows nothing, my way or the highway, or this fellow is destroying the sasana. So let us keep the mind of a beginner. When you are a beginner, you can accept all possibilities. But the instant you think you know, the possibilities are now locked. In looking inwards in meditation, we are actually not learning, but we are unlearning. We are letting go. All the stages that leads to jhana are stages of progressive letting go of our emotions. We need to let go even of our attachments to attainment, results, and knowledge. Let it all go. Having nothing to attain, you will have no hindrance in the mind. Yi wu suo de gu, xing wu guo ai. So let us all remain mentally 
ready to learn a beginner. Yi wu suo de gu, xin wu ko ai. Having nothing to attain with no hindrance in the mind. Wu ko ai gu, wu yu kong fu. When you come to a point where you have no need to impress anybody, that's when your freedom had truly begun. Any gain or attainment is just a passing thought, as ultimately there is no concrete being to achieve anything. This frees you from the stress of the need to achieve. We act without thoughts of the person doing the work, nor the magnitude or the return of the work done. Wu ko ai gu, wu yu kong fu. No hindrance, that's no fear. So people who are great people. Great bodhisattvas, great compassionate people, you will see they spend a whole lifetime of just serving with no fear, no hindrance, no need to worry whether I have achieved or not achieved. I will just do. Be not attached to results. Let the results take care of itself. Whoever can see this no longer needs anything to attain. See no more obstacles in their mind. Overcome all fear. Destroy all perceptions. He is free, happiness. Now, those who understand the emptiness of all phenomena, that means beyond the emptiness of self. Now we go to the next level, the emptiness of all phenomena. They have qualities of non-attainment, no settling down, not relying on any signs of being praised or blame or progress or no progress or mental impressions. They are free of the fears which can easily shock others, and they can function with metta, karuna, mudita, upeka, truly function with wisdom, freed from any restrictions. We begin with looking and seeing the emptiness of ourselves, and then you go on to see the emptiness of all phenomena. That means all what we perceive internally, externally. 远离颠倒梦想，究竟涅槃。Do not try to become anything, Ajahn Chah said. Do not make yourself into anything. Do not be a meditator. Do not become enlightened when you sit. Just let it be. When you walk, let it be. Grasp at nothing. Resist nothing. Beautiful. 远离颠倒梦想，究竟涅槃。When you leave far behind wrong views. When you overturn the misconceptions and delusions that clouds our minds, this dream of our sense impressions, we shatter the delusions through the awakening of the mind. Then, once you become awakened, you are in nibbana, the state of complete and final cessation of greed and craving, hatred and ignorance, the state of supreme happiness. Nibbana is not something far away. It is present at the moment of awakening. When the Lord Buddha became awakened at 35 years old, he already attained nibbana. He was freed from all greed, all craving, all hatred, all ignorance. He doesn't need praise. He doesn't need blame. He doesn't need anything. He just functions happily. In supreme happiness, and when he died at the age of eighty, there is pari nibbana, again nibbana, when the physical body now no longer becomes another form. Now there is no more pain of the physical body. The Chinese word wu is very very helpful. While wu means no or non or none, wu ku ji mie dao. Wu zi yi wu de, the word wu also conveys the principle of no grasping, no attachment. Like a mirror, you receive and relinquish all that goes in front of it, without grasping or clinging. We function calmly, joyfully, full-heartedly, doing our best, and you transcend the pleasant and unpleasant dichotomy. And the futile efforts of resisting the monsters and holding on to the angels. 
let me explain this word a little bit more. The original pictogram of the word Wu is that of a man standing with two outstretched arms holding a lot of things. Presently, the simplified character has completely lost its original essence. Ironically, Wu means the opposite. Do not hold onto things. It doesn't mean, brother Dr. Quack, not to have things. You can have things. It means you do not grasp onto them because all things are kong. If you attempt to grasp onto them, you are going to be very, very disappointed because they are unstable, unreliable, ever-changing. Now the pictogram for kong is that of a cloudless sky. It doesn't mean no sky, just that it is empty of any solid entity. It is closer to describing the emptiness of a cup or a pail than total void. It is not nothing, but it is empty of a solid substance. So we need to go beyond all concepts. Both form and emptiness are strategic understandings for us to achieve freedom and happiness. Remember, the ultimate aim is freedom and happiness. So the understanding of these two views of form and emptiness, they must be realized, used and mastered as needed for you and I to achieve the liberation of boundlessness in Chinese, zi zai. Self and not self, plurality and singularity are processes to be known, tools for us to use and not intellectual discussions, not philosophical discussion. Remember the Dhamma is a boat. It is a vehicle for us to use, to be unbounded for supreme happiness. And understanding emptiness is a liberating insight, not a philosophical view. In fact, if you grasp onto emptiness wrongly, it is like picking a poisonous snake by the wrong end. Now, in another sutta in Samyutta Nikaya 12.15, the Buddha explained to Kachana that for almost everybody, they will look upon the world as a duality, the notion of existence or the notion of non-existence. But for one who sees the original origin of the world as it really is correctly, there is no notion of non-existence because system living exists in regards to the world. And for one who sees the cessation of the world as it really is, there is no notion of existence of sister Liming because sister Liming is always changing. She is always evolving. This world, Kachana, is for the most part shackled by engagement, clinging and adherence. We cling to the time when we were young and beautiful, capable and fit. But this one with right view does not become engaged and cling through that engagement and clinging mental standpoint adherence. He does not take a stand about myself. He has no perplexity or doubt that what arises is only suffering arising. What ceases is only suffering ceasing. It's only activities in motion. His knowledge about this is independent of others. It is in this way, Kachana, that there is right view. All exists is one extreme. All does not exist is another extreme. Without veering towards either of these extremes, the Tathagata teaches the Dhamma by the middle, which is by dependent origination, causes and conditions. So we need to go beyond these concepts. We need to understand them, but after understanding them, we have to use them. They should be realized, used and mastered for us to achieve liberation. With wisdom, you flow like water. With the Dhamma, you flow now like water around rocks. You move in the path of least resistance and be very happy. Interestingly, Dhamma in Chinese, Fa. On the left side is San Dian Sui, water. And on the right side, 
my right, is the word to, to go out. When you understand reality, nature, applying it, you flow like water around obstacles, hence lessening your dis-ease, your distress. I like this. Enlightening is absolute cooperation with the inevitable because it defines enlightenment not just as a realization, but as an activity. Enlightenment, when you achieve it, awakening when you have it, is when everything within you is in cooperation with the flow of life itself, understanding the nature of life with the inevitable. So brother, Dr. Quack, yes, attachment to sensual pleasures can cause suffering, but so does aversion. Beware the pendulum of the mind. Don't fall into the trap of either or. Use the middle path. You will never be unhappy if you understand the difference between our needs, our desires, and luxuries. Now, the reality of the world is a flower will fall, even though you love it. A weed will grow, even though you do not love it. It is like that. So we got to live with the least resistance to this. And anyway, the difference between a flower and the wheat is just a matter of judgment. So brothers and sisters, we need contemplative insight. While some may dogmatically claim that only their version of the truth is the truth, and hence only they are doing the right things, all others being wrong. The Buddha insisted that every one of us must discover the truth for himself. Truth does not need to be defended. To understand emptiness requires that you and I perceive objects and ideas without prejudice, with right mindfulness. Zen Now, if you look at the word nian, on top is now, ting and the bottom is sing, which is mind. So you need to look at your present mind all the time. And remember, we started with guan zi zai. Contemplate, observe, zi ji, xian zai. Observe yourself, your mind, now, every moment. And this t-shirt is wonderful. Discover the true nature of your mind now. What are your thoughts? What are your feelings? Are they wholesome? Are they not? How do they come and go? Are you lost in thought? Come back to your senses now. So on the path to perfect wisdom, when you contemplate your Rupanama and your surroundings, you will realize the mental prisons we lock ourselves in. You will see the emptiness of the self. I have repeatedly emphasized this. You will see that the Rupa Nama is ever-changing, no concrete I, no concrete self, no unchanging I, no eternal self. But instead, we are the product of a temporary gathering of conditions that are constantly changing. And while this does not deny your existence, it cuts through your strong attachment to the illusion of a permanent self. You go on and you see how you perceive six sense organs, six sense objects, six consciousness. And you will realize that everything you see, touch, smell, hear, own, like, dislike is empty. Nothing has an independent existence and is constantly changing. This cuts through the illusion that there is anything that you can rely on that is stable for your comfort and happiness. And finally, the emptiness of concepts, that even our mental concepts are empty of a permanent form. When you truly understand emptiness, you will rise above duality. And the chains of our grasping and attachments, even to concepts, even to Dhamma and Adhamma are cut asunder, cut apart. And the Buddha say, when you understand that the Dhamma is like a raft and that you should let go even of positive things, the Dhamma, then how much more 
should you let go of negative things. By now, if you understand this sharing so far, you understand why all phenomena internally, externally, should not be clung to as I, my, or mine. So what we need to learn is not just emptiness, but going beyond the concepts of self, form, and emptiness. Disengaging selfishness, cravings, conceit, and conceptual prisons to be liberated. Enlightenment is awakening to this truth so that you become unbounded, so that you go altogether beyond, freed from divine and human bondages. And this is the supreme emptiness, the supreme happiness of Samavimoti or right liberation. Now, to the uneducated, when you are deluded, a rose is an entity, a solid entity, independent by itself, what we call rarity. But when you start to learn the truth, you realize that a rose is now not a rose, but it's in fact a composite of many non-rose elements, water, soil, sun, etc. Singularity. But when you have insight into reality, a rose is now an impermanent rose, whose beauty is to be seen and happily enjoyed while it lasts in its empty, ephemeral, non-self state. So you function with plurality within or amidst the understanding of singularity. Transcendental wisdom is your capability to be fully present to this reality of things. It is transcendent because it rises above the noise and delusion of daily life so that you can see the reality of life, the beauty of life, the connectedness of life. Now, this cartoon illustrates an important principle that we mustn't grasp onto the concepts or grasp the snake wrongly. This monk goes around saying, everything is empty, everything is empty, and he proudly announced his level of awakening. Everything, he said, is empty. The true nature of all things is empty. No, nothing, all empty. And the master take a stick and knock his head. And he said, what do you do that for? Ouch. And the master says, if everything is empty, where did that temper come from? So you mustn't misunderstand. Sister Li Ming does not have a concrete, unchanging, solid entity called Li Ming. She exists as a composite, an ephemeral person, being that is evolving, changing, becoming all the time. She is empty of anything eternal and unchanging. She has a nature. She will have dukkha. And that's because she has anatta, non-self. Because of the unreliable, unstable form that she is, she will force it. She will age she will grow old. That is beyond her control. So while she does not exist as a permanent structure, unchanging and eternal, she exists as a temporary ephemeral activity that is always continuing and will continue to become. So you must understand this and not get stuck in the concept that everything is empty or everything is solid. This is both these views of eternity, unchanging, and no existence are extremes which are rejected. So when you understand emptiness, you can live now mindfully in the present moment. You can fully live with metta karuna, mudita, and now, brothers and sisters, you will finally understand why you can live with upeka, equanimity. A lot of people cannot understand, how can I live with equanimity? When you understand emptiness, you will understand these four Brahma Viharas. You will understand how to live with equanimity, as you now know that in ultimate reality, nothing in reality is created or destroyed, is defiled or pure, is added or lost. 
So knowing the ephemeral nature of all conditioned things, please do not depend on it for your happiness. All conditioned phenomena, they are like dreams, illusions, bubbles, shadows, like dew drops and a lightning flash. Contemplate them thus, and you will be freed. So do you now understand anatta? From the path of purification, the Visuddhimagga, it is stated, for there is suffering, but none who suffers. Doing exists, although there is no doer. Nibbana is, but none who enters. Although there is a path, there is no goer. If you understand this gata, then the last one hour and 15 minutes that I had spent sharing had been very useful and very helpful. And now, if you understand this, you have opened your mind to a new level of understanding of the Dhamma. Now, emptiness is as important in the Theravada tradition as it is in the Mahayana. In the Pali Canon, there are four suttas, at least, that I'm aware of, where the Buddha teaches the meaning and application of emptiness, sunyata, Pali, sunata. And the first factor of the Eightfold Path is right view, zhen jian, how you see the world, your spectacles, are they correct? If your spectacles are not correct, everything is going to be blurred. Right view is ultimately knowing that the world is empty of any permanent self. There is no me here. This is not me. This is not mine. And you will have understood anatta in its three aspects. Now an unawakened mind cannot express the thoughts of an awakened mind. He can at best present his incomplete view using language and words, hopefully without critical errors. Now all teachings point towards the truth that needs to be self-realized as language inadequately express the insights of an awakened mind. So please do not mistake the finger for the moon. You need to see the moon for yourself. Thank you very much, brothers and sisters in the Dhamma. I know this sharing is a bit complicated and profound, but I sincerely hope that you understand. And I have up given these slides to the brothers and sisters, and I hope that they will be uh, they will be uploading it for sure. And when they upload it, I hope you can download it and take a look at it and hopefully understand it a little bit better. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Puna, for the thought-provoking session. Now we would like to open for questions. Please post your question in the comment section and I shall read out your question. Okay, uh, let's start the ball rolling. First question is from Dim A Piao. The question is, is there a Hat Sutra equivalent in the Pali Tipitaka? Brother Dim A Piao, the Heart Sutra is an extremely profound teaching. It is only in 260 words. And the Heart Sutra is originally not a sutra. It was the venerable Xuan Chang who edited it. And after that, he gave it the name, the Heart Sutra. Before the venerable Xuan Chang, there was no such word called Prajna Paramita Hidaya Sutra. It was known as a Dharani, which is in modern words, what we will call a mnemonic. In 260 words, the Venerable Xuan Chang very brilliantly incorporated many, many concepts of which I had shared tonight. And it is like a mnemonic, which people learn to constantly remind themselves of the profound teachings of the Buddha step by step. And it brings one who reads it right from the beginner to the stage of awakening. 
So if you are to ask, the answer is no, because it is not even a sutra. It is a mnemonic, a dharani, the author of which we do not know. And Venerable Sun Chang merely edited it and added it, added in additions which raised it to a far higher level than what it was before. And it has become, in fact, the probably the most well-known sutta chanted every day by the Mahayana practitioners. So it is not a sutta in that sense. And Majjhima Nikaya 22, its teachings are extremely profound. And it shares many, many common themes with what is taught in the Heart Sutta. Similarly, the other four that I put in my notes also share many themes which are similar. So please remember that all these are fingers pointing to the moon and the Heart Sutra, so-called Heart Sutra, is also a finger pointing to the moon, trying to teach very profound concepts to us or trying to help us remember and utilize very profound concepts. Okay, thank you, Dr. Vuna. Okay, the next question is by Ng So Mei. And the question is, when we are not excited or sad for whatever happens, aren't we just behaving like a stone? Well, you will read that one of the very important things that is achieved when one awakens is that the four winds no longer affect you. I'm sure, uh, brother or sister, you are a rat that praise and blame, etc., gain and loss, they no longer affect you. And in fact, the Buddha said that that is one of the big differences between an untrained mind whose mind state will shift like that from one to the other because of either praise or blame or gain or loss. But to the awakened person, his mind state is in samadhi. Samadhi, samadhi, sama, sama. His mind state is still. So gain and loss, praise and blame, etc., etc., are mind stage which do not affect him. He is happy because he understands. No, he is not a stone because the awakened person is in fact the most happy person. Nibbanam, haramam, sukham. When you become awakened, when you attain the state of Nibbana, you are in fact in a state of happiness because these things do not affect you. What you are not is you are not on an emotional roller coaster moving up and down like what most of us are. Today we wake up, we are very happy. Tomorrow we are very sad. We are all like emotional roller coasters. But sama samadhi gives us that stillness of mind to be emotionally independent of such things. All right? Okay. Thank you, Dr. Puna. The next question is from Ratna Jaita. The question is, can you explain the meaning of transcending the notion of self? Right now, I spent one and a half hours explaining that just now. <laughs> the self is what people think it's a permanent, unchanging object. And unfortunately, this idea sell to us, sold to us, of a permanent soul residing in a permanent heaven eternally in happiness has become so much in common consciousness that people are stuck in it. 2,600 years ago, people believed in an atta, an unchanging permanent self that moves from body to body in life to life. The Buddha looked and looked and looked and saw that that is not true. And he called it anatta in Pali, uh, sorry, in Sanskrit, anatman. Transcending the notion of self means you understand that this illusion of a concrete self is not true. You have transcended and gone beyond that delusion 
or that false understanding. And you realize that right now you are a activity in ceaseless change. Ratna exists, but Ratna is constantly changing. The Ratna of 10 years ago, who was a little bit high on the BMI, is not the same as the Ratna now who is underweight. The Ratna now is not going to be the same as the Ratna 10 years from now, who may again be high on the BMI. So Ratna doesn't have a permanent self that she thinks she has. Ratna needs to transcend that notion that she is this body, that this body is eternal, and that even after death, this body is going to go to an eternal heaven or burn in an eternal hell, that needs to be transcended because that is not a right belief. All right, right now, go back, look from the start again, the sharing. Okay, thank you, Dr. Puna. Uh, another question is also from Dean, Dim A Piao. I am not who I was from endless lifetimes ago. So why am I rotated to suffer or benefits from the vipaka from my past intentions? Brother Dim, you were not who you were when you were a child. The brother Dim of today is not the same as the brother Dim when you were 10 years old. But what you did when you are 10 years old is going to affect what is the brother Dim today. Let me not use brother Dim as an example. Let's use brother Bankir as an example. Brother Bankir is a student. So let's say brother Bankir is a very good student. He studies very hard. He doesn't waste all his time paktor. He doesn't spend his time and his father's hard earned money in discotheques and whatnot. And he gets good results. So he graduates as a civil engineer. He goes on and works as a civil engineer, et cetera, et cetera. His life a year from now, five years from now, 10 years from now is going to be radically different from the banquet who is very, very lazy, who doesn't study, who wastes money, wastes time, and barely passes his exam. In fact, did not pass his exam. And what has happened? The rest of his life, is completely different. Now the banquet 20 years from now is going to be a completely different person from the banquet today. You may think, or he may think that it is a continuity, but it is actually an activity that is going on. It is not a solid entity. He is an activity. As I said, if I'm an alien who can see beyond our infra and ultraviolet, I'm going to see him like what you see on that television thermal sensor. It's just activity in motion. Now, if you can understand that, you will understand that even from this life to the next, you, Brother Dim, the Lego block who makes you now will be reconstructed or recycled. A very good word is recycled because you are not destroyed. You'll be recycled into something else. That something else is the vipaka of what you are doing now. Just like Brother Bankit's vipaka of studying hard now is that he's going to graduate as a civil engineer. He's going to work. He's going to get married, raise a family. In contrast to the vipaka of Brother Bankit, who doesn't make it because he doesn't study and then suffers the consequences. So similarly, the karma that you and I plan today will determine that process in which you are going to be recycled into. So the next becoming is not the same as who you are, but that next becoming arose from what you did. It goes on to the past and will go on to the future. You are like that stream or like that river continuously flowing on. And this is a concept which we try so hard to share. So luckily a good word called recycling came about in the language. For lack of a better word, when the early translators tried, they are stuck with words like reincarnation. They are stuck with words like transmigration, which are completely not reflective of what the Buddha taught. Brother Dim, if you read what the Buddha taught Venerable Sati, then you will understand what I mean. Because there was a Venerable Sati 
who went around teaching that it is the consciousness that goes from life to life to life to life to life, like a being, like a soul that transmigrate. And the Buddha had to correct him in a very nice discourse. You can easily get that discourse online by just Googling. And you will get what I am trying to share in the last half hour or hour. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Puna. We have now